The six o'clock news starts right now. We begin with the latest on President Donald Trump's condition after he tested positive for COVID-19. The president arriving at Walter Reed Medical Center less than 30 minutes ago. The White House says President Trump has a low grade fever, is experiencing chills along with congestion and a cough. They say he was taken to the military hospital out of an abundance of caution and is expected to stay there a few days. The president's COVID-19 diagnosis is an October surprise unlike any other. The November election now just 32 days away. Jesse DeGoyado now with what local voters are saying about what all this means to them. Just about everyone lining up outside the Bear County Elections Office, registering to vote or dropping off their mail-in ballots, was aware President Trump tested positive for COVID-19. Well, I guess it's what goes around comes around. He didn't believe in it, and now he's, he's a victim of that. He was just in denial. It's a shame. It really is. I think that's pretty crazy. Uh, I hope all is well. Uh, I hope everything goes his way. For him. But he says he's still not voting for the president, while others may because of his diagnosis. Yeah, he's probably going to get some sympathy votes, I, I would guess. I also asked the head of the UTSA Political Science Department, John Taylor, to weigh in. How do you think all of this will affect his re-election chances? It, it's going to be difficult. The chances of President Trump winning re-election dwindle by the day. Being off the campaign trail, being ill make it that much more difficult. Others say coming down with a potentially deadly virus could be the proof he and other skeptics needed. It really calls to light that we, this coronavirus is real, it's not fake. Even those who support the president will now look at it and say, well, maybe we ought to wear masks too. When is he going to finally tell people, hey, wear your mask? Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, 12 Texas Mexican Mafia members arrested in San Antonio. The Department of Justice says the group faces federal drug charges in connection with a drug operation here in the Alamo City. During a couple of raids throughout the city, authorities seized a total of 15 guns, 20 kilograms of methamphetamine and cocaine. An indictment claims the suspects are responsible for distributing controlled substances from July to September 23rd of this year. The Department of Justice says the suspect's first court appearance is set for next week. Also new today, San Antonio police telling us they've arrested a 17-year-old man in connection with the murder of Sebastian Carpio. Carpio was reported missing last month. His body was found inside a burning vehicle in West Bear County. Police say the 17-year-old suspect turned himself in yesterday. He now faces a murder charge. He threatened to be a, quote, active shooter on base at Fort Hood. Now a San Antonio man has been indicted on a charge of felony terroristic threat. This is 48-year-old Mario Eloy Pena. The Bear County District Attorney's Office says back in July, Pena posted on social media that he wanted to retaliate for Vanessa Guillen's murder on base. According to an arrest affidavit, Pena's wife was concerned about the threats and contacted police. The report also states that Pena has a violent criminal history, including a discharge of a firearm with bodily harm offense in California. New details on a deadly motel shooting that happened yesterday. The Bear County Medical Examiner has identified a 40 year old man who died after being shot in the chest as Mark Jimenez. San Antonio police say two other men were shot in the 1300 block of Roosevelt Avenue around 2.30 yesterday morning. They released photos of two men believed to be connected to the crime. If you have any information, call SAPD's Homicide Office at 210-207-7635. And we've also learned the name of a 36-year-old man fatally shot on the east side yesterday. He's been identified as Jack Bledsoe Jr. San Antonio police say he was shot in the head during a dispute in the 500 block of Dory Street yesterday morning. Half a dozen people take it in for questioning. It's unclear if any of them were actually charged. The latest Bear Facts KSAT San Antonio report poll shows that mostly a solid support for a trio of sales tax proposals on the November ballot, though that level of support varies. San Antonio voters will be asked about renewing a tax to fund pre-K 4SA, as well as a pair of proposals to use another one eighth cent sales tax first for workforce development and then for transportation. Our Garrett Berger talked to each of the campaigns behind those about the numbers. 
The results of the latest Bear Facts, KSATS, San Antonio report poll came as good news for supporters of each of the three sales tax proposals. Wow, uh, that's very encouraging. The poll shows solid support for each when San Antonio voters were read the ballot language. Even the least supported, that for transportation, had 59% say they would likely vote for it. Though with a little more than a month from the election, none were claiming victory yet. You know, you you can never let up. You can never take anything for granted. The vote to renew pre-K for SA's sales tax had the most support at 66%. The tax to pay for a workforce development program did near as well at 64%. It uh, just reveals that people are very concerned about the job loss and that any kind of activity to help bring higher skills for better paid jobs. That proposal would redirect a tax that has funded a popular aquifer protection program for two decades. But when respondents were given more information on the city's plans to continue funding aquifer protection another way, support plummeted from 64% down to 47. The chairman for the campaign pushing for that initiative chalks it up to people's interpretation of the polling question. It doesn't say either or, but I think sometimes people think it's either or. He says the response does show the campaign will have to do a good job explaining the link between the aquifer program and the new proposal. If so, they have just over a month to do it. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And coming up in our KSAP Q&A today, we speak to a member of the Bear Facts team to break down even more results from this latest poll and some of the biggest takeaways that's coming up at just about 630. Before blacks were welcomed in Major League Baseball, many talented athletes resorted to playing in the Negro Leagues and on neighborhood teams. Back in the 1950s and 60s, the east side of San Antonio was an area where a lot of skills were honed and baseball kept youth occupied. I recently took a trip to Pittman Sullivan Park where the legacy created back then still shining today. We really got started because we couldn't go play in other, other leagues. In the 1960s, baseball was a segregated sport and minority players in San Antonio did not have an even playing field. We needed to have a place to go and we never really wanted you to give us anything. We just wanted to be included. We just wanted to play. It's why Nathaniel and Odie Davis III's father, Odie Davis Jr., created a neighborhood baseball team known as the Denver Heights Bears. They played at Pittman Sullivan Park and attracted a pool of East Side talent. It was so important that everyone had a way out on the weekends, you know, to go right. practice and then come and loosen up and play a game on Sundays. We had Eight good and coaches and uh, that were teaching us uh, really some values, right. you know, and responsibility. But the efforts to offer black youth opportunities in baseball were often met with challenges. In addition to playing against teams in the South Texas Negro League, the Bears also faced white teams that didn't show sportsmanlike conduct. They would tell you in the beginning that yeah. we don't want you here. And so we're going to do everything in our power to make sure you lose. And they did. But the players fought back. They would cheat and they would do everything. And we would just come together and that's what made us stronger. Right. And they, we would just come together and we would just beat them with our bats. We, just, we would just beat them up. Nathaniel Davis took over as manager of the Bears when their father died in 1975 and kept the team going until 2005. Odie Davis III got the chance to play in the major leagues for the Texas Rangers and the Cleveland Indians. Opportunities forged years earlier. They really, yeah, and they gave the kids something to do. They look forward to it. And right outside of Pittman Sullivan Park sits the Davis Scott YMCA, which was built back in 1979 and later partly named after Odie Davis Jr. Many say that Davis Jr.'s legacy is a big part of the reason why children and adults from all walks of life have that recreational space that's still serving the community today. Love those stories. Thanks, Devin. A couple of traffic alerts as we head into the weekend. On the city's west side, all main lanes of Loop 410 from Marbach Road to Military Drive will be closed through Monday. The Highway 151 eastbound frontage road from Loop 410 to Ingram Road also closed. TxDOT says crews will be installing steel beams and continuing construction on flyover ramps there. The work begins at 8 tonight and will go through 5 Monday morning. You're being asked to just avoid the area if you can. On the northwest side of town, Wurzbach Parkway between Northwest Military and Blanca Road will also be closed this weekend. Crews will be removing concrete forms under the land bridge there and finishing up other parts of the Robert L.B. Tobin land bridge project. It's all to provide a safe path into Hardburger Park. The road closure begins at 9 o'clock tonight. All lanes should be reopened by 5 a.m. on Monday.
And taking a look at time saver traffic with Trans Guide, it is Friday at 6 o'clock, so you can imagine that there is some slow moving traffic there at I-35 and Church Parkway. No major backups, though, to report. Traffic moving steadily, slowly, uh, looks like uh, just the normal Friday. Friday commute slowly but surely getting to the weekend, <laughs> right? Look outside with live cam right now. 82 degrees out there a little bit cooler than we were this time yesterday, but this stretch of days this week, Adam, it's just been so nice. Yeah, it sure has been something else, hasn't it? And it's going to continue into the weekend with a few modifications. I'll get to those details in a moment. First of all, the aquifer down half a foot today. We're now two feet below the October average. Mold is moderate and ragweed is moderate and you can see ragweed season really is extended and it peaks here late September into October and fall elm usually peaks as well about this time. So it's that time of year for some of those allergens to really come out and be noticed. Del Rio 87, 83 in Kerrville, 79 right now in Rock Springs and 82 in San Antonio. This evening clear sky, pretty much a calm wind and very comfortable low humidity by 9 p.m. 75 11 p.m. 70 a good evening to be outdoors this weekend nothing but sunshine well into the 80s with some comfortable mornings tomorrow morning 58 talk about tropical depression 25 coming up. We are rounding out another week of daily briefings on local COVID-19 cases. The numbers continue to be encouraging and head in the right direction, but we're still very much in this pandemic. Let's listen in. To Our medical director for San Antonio Metro Health, and we do have a special guest tonight, Graham Weston, who is the chairman of the Board of Community Labs. We'll be talking a little bit about a partnership that we're happy to announce this evening. But first, let's go to the numbers. We have 103 new cases reported tonight of COVID-19, which brings a total since the pandemic began to 58,039. Our new seven day moving average has dropped to 150. And again, that is a more accurate picture of what's happening day to day with regard to the coronavirus here in San Antonio. We do have some good news also uh, as we go into the weekend. There are no new deaths to report tonight. The total number of COVID deaths in our community remains at 1,138. That's loved ones and neighbors and colleagues lost. So please keep their families in your prayers. Tonight, there are 196 COVID patients in the hospital. That's the first time we've been below 200 in many, many months, so let's keep that up. There are, however, 29 COVID-related admissions, admissions to the hospital since yesterday. We have 76 patients in the ICU, flat since yesterday, and 31 patients on ventilators. The hospital system as a whole remains at the low end of the high stress score. So tonight we do have an exciting announcement um, and let me preview, preview that for you. On Monday, we will begin offering free testing for people without symptoms. These will be FDA authorized nasal PCR tests, which with results expected back in less than 24 hours. The testing expansion is a partnership between Metro Health, Community Labs and BioBridge Global. We'll start offering asymptomatic testing for the first hour of the day before eventually expanding those hours. So that's 10 a.m. at Cuellar Community Center on Monday. Tuesday, we'll add Ramirez Community Center at 10 a.m. and Wednesday at Freeman Coliseum when it opens at 9 a.m. After this soft launch, we'll expand the hours of availability and you can find more information about this on our website and Graham Weston and Dr. Wu will talk a little bit about it more before our Q&A. First, let me turn it over to Judge Wolf. Just want to say a couple of things because I want to leave plenty of time for Graham. Uh, let me first of all express my uh, condolences to the President and his family, uh, I believe he and his wife both have uh, uh, had COVID and they're taking him over to Walter Reed Hospital now. And we pray for him uh, that he'll recover uh, promptly. Uh, second, uh, Mayor mentioned that uh, this is the first time in a good while since we've been below 200 in the hospital. The actual last time we were there was June the 15th. What's that, three or four months ago, I guess now when we were at 87, so that's good news. We broke that 200 number. We still need to get it down a heck of a lot more. Long way to go yet, mask, social distance, sanitation. I think we all know anybody can get it now, and it can be very serious, and we saw what happened with the president today. 
Yeah, and that transcends all politics. We do keep our First Lady and the President in our prayers, as we do all members of our family who have come down with COVID-19. As always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by going to covid19.sanantonio.gov. You can also find the information on assistance programs, the Housing Emergency Assistance Program, as well as the Job Training Program. If you are displaced, income displaced, or job displaced by COVID-19, you can enroll in our Job Training Program to get skilled up for jobs that are available today in our community, call 210-224-HELP for more information on that program. Dr. Wu, myself, and the judge are available for questions, but before we get to that, uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Graham Weston, the chairman of Community Labs, to talk about this exciting new uh, partnership that is going to help us uh, keep control of this pandemic and also keep our community safe. Graham. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, what happened a few months ago, back in March, uh, I got COVID for my son, who didn't have any COVID symptoms whatsoever. So I caught the virus from an, from an asymptomatic carrier that I like to call a silent spreader. And this has got, really got my attention because I realized that as I read the, the news, you could see that so many people were getting uh, getting COVID from people without symptoms. About half the people who get COVID get it from people who don't have symptoms at that time. And so this really uh, got me thinking about the question. And uh, ultimately, I teamed up with, uh, in classic San Antonio style, with uh, with great collaborators here in San Antonio. The, the Tobin Foundation, the Krenkowski Foundation, and I have funded the creation of a laboratory right here in San Antonio that can test 12,000 tests per day of asymptomatic people. And that is that, that lab was just ramped up in the last 10 days. We tested more than 1,000 a, a tests this week, and we're going to be get, going up and up uh, in the number of tests in the coming weeks. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be uh, announcing this partnership with the county, with the city, and Metro Health. Um, it really is a great step forward. This is going to allow people to go and get tested even if they don't have symptoms. There's so many silent spreaders out there. It, this is a great way to try to eliminate and suppress the virus even further. We'll also be better prepared if we have another spike. This would not have been happened with, happen, uh, was not have happened without the collaboration, um, again, of the, of the Coben Foundation, the Krenkowski Foundation, but more importantly, are the medical organizations here in San Antonio. BioBridge Global, which is our blood bank here in town, they're running the lab, they're the, the, the brains behind the laboratory operations, and UT Health Science Center here in San Antonio. This is our own medical school. And a big announcement today from the city and Graham Weston you see there a very well known local businessman and also chairman of the board of community labs. He's talking about the creation of a new lab that can test 12,000 asymptomatic patients a day. And so the city saying in partnership with that organization, the city is now going to be testing asymptomatic patients, people who are not showing any symptoms at all of COVID-19 uh, at their community centers, at the centers that the city is running. They're going to start that on Monday. And the mayor said just for the first hour of the day uh, at those centers, the local community centers, Freeman Coliseum as well, and they're eventually going to expand those hours for testing asymptomatic patients. Of course, of course, they're going to have all that information on the city's website with those details. But the overall point now people without symptoms who think they have been around somebody who has had COVID, they can get tested through the city. Yeah, this says the mayor announcing 103 new cases of COVID-19, bringing the Bear County total to 58,000. 39. We know that the seven day moving average, though, has dropped to 150 and no new deaths to report. That is the good news. Let's take a look at the weather out there right now. Adam Kasky standing by with your weekend forecast. That's right. We have uh, some changes into the weekend, but nothing major. More importantly, we have tropical depression 25 to talk about. It's quiet over Texas, just some clouds moving through the panhandle in North Texas today. Tropical depression 25 is in the Western Caribbean and is going to affect the Yucatan Peninsula as we get into this weekend and then emerge over the Bay of Campeche. So let's take a look at the forecasted track here, likely to become a tropical storm later tonight and into early Saturday morning. It'll likely just skim the northeastern portion of the Bay of Campeche, but bring rainfall to 
pretty much the entire uh, peninsula here. I should say the Yucatan Peninsula just skimming it there, but bringing a lot of rainfall and potential for flooding, especially in the mountainous areas on those hillsides that get a lot of rain. And then notice how into the middle part of next week, it's still far south and east of Texas. And right now, odds favor this completely staying away from us through its life cycle. Here's a look at the spaghetti plots. And for the most part, the consensus is to take it westward into the Bay of Campeche as we get into the middle of next week. Tomorrow morning, 52 in Kerrville and Fredericksburg, 62 in Carrizo Springs, 58 in San Antonio, Stone Oak about 58, 59 New Braunfels, and 57 in La Soya. Then we get into the afternoon tomorrow, just like today, mid to upper 80s, Von Army 87, 84 in Timberwood Park along with Bernie. So this weekend we will have comfortable conditions still not a whole lot of humidity, but you will notice some morning clouds on Sunday and a little bit warmer that morning at 64. Otherwise, it's just more of what we've become accustomed to this week. We don't mind it. I can get used to this. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Sports is coming up next. Our big game coverage road trip tonight will feature a District 15 2A2 contest between the Sabinaw Yellow Jackets and the Dehennis Cowboys. Sabinaw's 4 1 this season, dropping their district opener last Friday night 28 24 to Charlotte. Dehennis is 2 0 and won their district opener last week with Benavides 50 18. Sabinaw is led by senior quarterback Grayson Kowalski, who has 742 yards passing and seven touchdowns. They go with 250 yards rushing and three more TDs. Sabinaw and Dehennis are separated by 11 miles, so this is always a monster game. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. Uh, they've been our rivalry for the longest time now, and uh, we lost to them twice in a row. And you know we're gonna we're gonna take the dub this year, so it's gonna mean a lot to me. This is my first year in Savannah, but it's it's a big rivalry because anywhere you go in town, they they don't care about any game. They just ask you, you gonna beat the Hennis this year? It means a lot. These guys are my brothers. I would do anything for them, and I hope they would do the same for me. And they have a really, they like to get into it with the Hennis when we play them. That's really the only way you can put it. Sabinall is looking to break a two-game slide against the Hennis. Now, our second game has Southwest Legacy at the Medina Valley Panthers in non-district action. Both are 0-1. Medina Valley opened with the, uh, the season with a home loss to New Braunfels Canyon 28-7. Coach Crisp and his Panthers, well, they want to play tough teams during non-district because it's the best way to see where you are while getting ready for district games. Medina Valley feels they have another tough one tonight with the Titans. Southwest Legacy, uh... We know they're a pretty good team, uh, we know they're well coached, they like to play fast and so we're just going to be ready to go hit them. They're going to be a good team, um, we know they're pretty aggressive off the ball, their D-line uh, is pretty large, but uh, once, I mean, if we play our 1-11 we'll be able to move the ball downfield on them and our defense are going to get the stops. They're a new school, the, they got some big guys and they're going to come out and uh, be ready for us, so we got to be ready too. Southwest Legacy is now a third-year varsity program. They went 0-10 their first season and 6-4 and last season. All right, here's the road trip tonight to Hennis at Sabinaw, Southwest Legacy at Medina Valley, and Marion at Lytle. Catch it all on the night beat. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Steelers-Titans game that was postponed from Sunday after a COVID-19 outbreak within the Titans organization has been rescheduled for week seven on October 25th. Meanwhile, the Carolina Panthers have used robots to help fight COVID-19 as the club gets ready to allow fans back to Bank of America Stadium. The germ-killing robots are made right here by San Antonio-based company Zenex. The Panthers purchased two Zenex Light Strike robots, which the company said eliminates the virus that causes COVID-19 on surfaces in many. The robots will be used in locker rooms, showers, and other areas throughout Panthers' home stadium. The Panthers will host the Arizona Cardinals Sunday at noon. Guys? It's got to be cool to operate that thing. I know, right? <laughs> the San Antonio product. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. A little more than a month away from Election Day and all this week we have been diving into the latest results of the Bear Facts KSAT San Antonio report poll to find out exactly where San Antonians stand on some of the biggest issues, how they feel about some of our elected officials and candidates. Let's bring in part of the Bear Facts team for today's KSAT Q&A, Lisa Baratachea. Thank you for being with us. 
this evening. I'm interested to get your perspective. You have a background in public policy. You're very well versed on uh, the big community issues that we all face. So looking at this latest batch of results, what was a big surprise for you or were there any in these responses? Um, I think that my my biggest surprise was how well the referendums are polling. All three referendums poll so well, and you know, in this time where people are have uh, are very conscientious about spending, um, people have, have struggled with finding food and maintaining their jobs. You know, for us to see so much support for there to be support for other people to support jobs programs, to support transit and transportation, to support pre-K. I mean, every every penny is important. And for our community to see the value in helping others and helping the community as a whole, I think really stands out to me. Uh, another thing that kind of uh, stands out is that even though we've been in pandemic mode for several months, we have seen an increase in what people are uncertain about the future. So people, we, we ask people, is the worst yet to come or is the worst over? Um, the worst yet to come has really kind of is been stagnant. The worst is over. We see more, um, more Republicans saying that the worst is over. But the amount of people who say, I don't know, has doubled. So it was like, you know, 10, 11 percent and, and now it's 20 percent. And so I think that that's telling that there's a lot of uncertainty of what what the future holds for everybody. And Lisa, in contrast to the referendum results, when voters were asked about using money from the city budget to fund yeah. aqua for protection, the support dropped to less than half. Yeah. Um, so. Because we are um, not affiliated with any organization and we didn't have to just stick to ballot language and see what the ballot was going to say, um, all of the ballot initiatives that we asked about were uh, from the ballot. So it wouldn't be, ha would be anything different than what people would see when they go vote. And we took the liberty to ask another question just to kind of dig a little deeper of how the impact of the language regarding the aquifer would pull. And so the aquifer language is on the jobs program ballot initiative and uh, only on that one. And so when people were told that um, if the city takes care of this item, uh, would you be more supportive of this uh, initiative? And um, in the ballot language, it's in there. But the highlight of it says this is a program for jobs and scholarships and it has no new taxes. And so I think people saw that, heard that and thought, OK, that's great. I'm supportive of that. And then when we pause and say, oh, and it's from the aquifer protection funds, people were less um, less supportive. So uh, I think that we as a community, it, you know, it, we need to make sure that the message is understood. We need to make sure that people know what they're voting on. It's a long ballot. Uh, people might get tired. Um, so I think that um, you know we need to continue to work hard. And the people who are advocating for the for that initiative, they need to be able. To, they need to um, ensure their message and get get it out and and speak to why it's so important. And we have been covering this issue, those referendums that will be on the ballot, how the money is expiring from the aquifer protection program and that one eight cent sales tax would then be used to these other uh, initiatives if voters approve that. So people can go to our website right now, see our coverage and also see all of the uh, results of uh, the poll and we've been showing some of those with a lot of information so i want to give people the chance to go to our website and and check out more of that uh, another thing that th this poll asked about that i thought was very interesting not just about how people feel about the candidates who they're going to vote for who they're likely to vote for but how they're going to vote and when they're going to vote so what did this poll find in terms of voters attitudes and their plans so interestingly they uh, most most people, 59% of people, said that they're planning to early vote. Not not as not a high turnout for the or, uh, for day of election or for mail. Um, there were uh, a slight increase in Democrat response to 
are uh, uh, mail in ballots, um, but only 29%. Um, the majority of people are, are planning on voting early. So I think that that will make um, Jackie Callan very happy. Um, and um, I think that in addition to the turning out early, um, the mail in ballot question, which has been so, uh, has dominated the, the news so often recently, there was a lot. We, we pulled, uh, if people were interested in policy changing. On, on mail-in ballots. And pe people were very supportive of a, a policy change. Uh, people thought it was a um, less risky to their health. They thought it was easier. Uh, and this is across the spectrum. Ds and Rs thought it was easier and it was less risky. And um, both sides of the aisle also agree that it would increase turnouts. Um, interestingly, voter fraud was not something that people largely thought was a problem. Um, there was a, a slightly more people who were Republican thought it, it was opportunity for fraud. But overall, um, people don't really think that it's going to less than less than half the people thought that it was a, a problematic um, and leading to fraud. And Lisa, before we go, I want to give you a chance to plug the Bear Facts website, tell people what they can do when they get there. Thank you so much. So uh, our Bear Facts poll, we just started it this year. This is our fourth poll. You can go to our website, bearfacts.org.org to, to see all of our polls, to see all of the data, all of the facts. In fact, you can take the poll yourself under the Voice It uh, drop down. You can go and take the poll to see the questions, to read all the questions, to read how we um, created the questions, um, how they are how they are asked. And um, if you, you are interested, um, please take it yourself. So the, the data that we are collecting from the online poll is not the, the data that you have been seeing tonight. Um, that information is done in a science with a scientific a pollster who has his own methodology. And so it is um, not included in what our reporting. Um, it's a way for people to see how we are doing what we're doing. A great way to keep an eye on the gauge of uh, San Antonio voters. Lisa Barathechea, thank you very much. To, 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 to amplify the voice of the people, to shape the future of our community. So that's what we are wanting to do. Lisa, thank you. We'll be right back. You don't have to be a NASA scientist to discover new planets, apparently. NASA launching a website called Planet Patrol, where members of the public can collaborate with astronomers to hunt for new worlds. They'll be sorting through images collected by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. Pretty cool. Over the course of a year, TESS captures hundreds of thousands of snapshots. But it's too many for scientists to examine without help, and that's where the volunteers come in. They'll answer questionnaires as they sift through images to help researchers narrow down the list of potential planets. I would love to see some of those responses. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Look outside with live cam. Hopefully we can continue this weather into the weekend, Adam. It's been so nice. Yeah, it has been fantastic, and we are going to continue it. You notice in that live picture there, just a hint of haze in the sky. That's some smoke from the western wildfires that moved overhead today. Just a hint of it. Most people aren't even going to notice, except for a little extra color at sunrise and sunset. We topped out at 84 degrees today after a morning low of 62. High temperatures, we're in the 80s. Only 80 even in Fredericksburg. Del Rio 88 along with Creasel Springs. And New Braunfels topped out at 85. We'll talk more about the weekend weather and also Tropical Depression 25 coming right up. All right, wondering about those cool mornings. Are those going to last Saturday, <laughs> Sunday? And you know, I think tomorrow is going to be very similar to what we've been having Sunday, just a little bit warmer, but not all that noticeably different. Let's talk about the tropics. It's quiet across Texas right now. We have some clouds in North Texas. That's it. But you get down into the Western Caribbean, and that's where we have Tropical Depression 25 likely to become our next tropical storm later tonight. It's a very broad system. You can see convection and precipitation spreading from the Yucatan Peninsula all the way over Cuba and some of it even being thrown over South Florida as well. It's a weak system right now and is, as I mentioned, expected to become a low end tropical storm later on tonight. And of course, on the night beat after the NBA playoffs or finals, I should say, we will have an update on this. It's this weekend. It should just skim across that northeastern 
corner of the Yucatan Peninsula and then arc its way westward into the Bay of Campeche as we get into next week. Right now, all indications are that this will remain a tropical storm and throughout its lifespan, Odds favor it steering clear of Texas, but of course it's something we'll keep a close eye on and keep you updated. The primary consensus here is that westward turn. Of course, we have some outliers in the computer models as usual. Usually those outliers, you just throw them out. There's that little bit of haze in the air. Again, I mentioned we have some a little bit of smoke from western wildfires overhead. So you'll notice a little extra color to the sunset this evening. 82 degrees right now, dew point of 50. So Comfortable out there, not all that humid. Birdies at 77, New Braunfels, your 83, Canyon Lake already 79, Pleasanton 81, and Hondo, along with Castroville at 84. So some locations down in the 70s at this hour, but I am anticipating temperatures to fall off pretty quickly this evening. Great weather for Friday night football. Pleasant, comfortable, low humidity, and it's one of those evenings where you can kind of wear whatever you want. It's not going to be too warm, not going to be too cool. Dew points also on the low end. So we're looking at deweys right now in the 40s to near 50. So that puts us in the comfortable range that is going to change a little bit this weekend. Not a lot, but as we get into Sunday, notice those dew points are back in the mid 60s. So you may notice a hint of humidity in the air for the first part of Sunday, and that's also going to lead to some low morning clouds. These aren't major changes, but it's what we often see around here. The low morning clouds around sunrise, so early riser Sunday will notice that that hint of humidity in the air and then the afternoon is going to be like every other day we've been experiencing this week. So no huge changes this weekend. This evening, as I mentioned, comfortable temperatures falling through the 70s, 8 p.m. 77 by 10 p.m. 73 and 12 a.m. Low humidity, 68 clear sky overnight and pretty much a calm wind. 87 and sunny by Saturday afternoon. Sunday, pretty much the same thing. Just the little difference is the morning's going to be a little bit warmer in the mid 60s and we'll have some of that low cloud cover. Then we get into next week and it's pretty much more of the same. Mornings will be right around 60 degrees. Afternoons well into the 80s to near 90 degrees. No major warming trend anytime soon, but also no big cold front anticipated within the foreseeable future. We're looking at just sunshine all the way through and unfortunately a 0% chance of rain. Hey, if we can't get some rain, at least we have more pleasant weather to look forward to. I'll definitely take it. Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. New this morning, a man taken to the hospital in serious condition after San Antonio police say he was shot overnight. Officers say this all happened around 3 this morning in the 11,000 block of Hebner Road. They say a man in his 30s was on a motorcycle when a woman walked on into the parking lot and shot him in the abdomen. The suspect then took off running towards the back of an apartment complex. Also new this morning, three people made it out safely after a fire broke out at a home in Converse. According to the Bear County Sheriff's Office, the fire was contained to the back of the house and firefighters managed to get it knocked down pretty quickly. Investigators are working to determine how it all started. No one was hurt. Just about everyone lining up outside the Bear County Elections Office, registering to vote or dropping off their mail-in ballots, was aware President Trump tested positive, coming down with a potentially deadly virus could be the proof he and other skeptics needed. It really calls to light that we, this coronavirus is real. It's not fake. Even those who support the president will now look at it and say, well, maybe we ought to wear masks. Two at six, 12 Texas Mexican mafia members arrested in San Antonio. The Department of Justice says the group faces federal drug charges in connection with a drug operation here in the Alamo City. During a couple of raids throughout the city, authorities say seized a total of 15 guns, 20 kilograms of methamphetamine and cocaine. An indictment claims the suspects are responsible for distributing controlled substances from July to September 23rd of this year. The Department of Justice says the suspect's first court appearance is set for next week. A landlocked city looking to bring in more revenue. I'll tell you about Aviation District on the night beat. In the buzz, whether you love it or hate it, pumpkin spice seems to be on pretty much everything, including apparently turkey. Hmm. The Honey Baked Ham Company testing out a pumpkin spice glazed turkey breast. 
I'll pass, but you can get one during the month of October if you're in a select U.S. city. The company says the flavors will add some seasonal flair to its traditional sweet and crunchy glaze. It says you can choose between roasted or smoked varieties. Add that one to the list. <laughs> You know, it might not be that bad, to be honest with you, because turkey thinking, goes with pumpkin. You know, oh, ham. It could work. I could yeah. see ham, ham maybe yeah. a little bit more. With I'll, the sweet glaze, you know? Another, nope. Either way, it's we're, up to we're you. We're debating to big own. issues here. I'm glad yeah. we're all in on this. We, we debate about the oddest things around here yeah. when we're not on air. So anyway, we or could go on. sometimes when we are yep. on air. Valid point. <laughs> And people at home are saying, just get, wrap Just look at those maps. There we go. Okay. <laughs> it's a nice week ahead. It is. A good weekend. It will be in the upper 50s tomorrow morning by the afternoon, back into the mid to upper 80s. Nothing but sunshine all weekend. We're all acting like it is such a Friday. <laughs> Thanks for watching. All right. We'll see you back here at 10 on the night.